Thanks. Thanks. Uh, certainly, thanks for the invitation to come, and uh, I'm happy to be anywhere these days. So uh, glad to, certainly glad to be here in Boston with you. Well, certainly we all know we've heard a lot of nice work from Todd and, and shown us some tremendous complications, and luckily most of those aren't his. Uh, we have the same problem out in the West Coast with the similar kind of things. And we can see some nice work done on the West Coast showing us if we've had one repair, we've got a 30% chance of back in 10 years. Two repairs, 40% chance we're back in eight years. Three repairs, 50% chance we're going to be back in six years. Certainly, we know once we've had a problem, they come back. That's some nice work we did recently. I put together three databases with uh, Mike Lang's group and Scott Roth, where we can see very nicely that once it starts, it keeps going. And they keep the gift that keeps on giving, so to speak. And if we look at Domino World, we're right up there with the rest of them, with the big boys. The colorectal, complex colorectal, upper GI, esophageal pancreatic cases, complication risk are just as high. And the question is, what do we do to prevent that? Readmissions, Todd showed us in the state already, 20% of those surgical readmissions are related to ventral hernias. So we're big players. The question is, how do we prevent it? Well, I like to divide it up into pre-op, peri-op, or post media peri-op, and post-op. And certainly, John Wooden said it well. Most people probably don't remember John Wooden, the coach in basketball, the winning, still the winningest coach in basketball. You know, fail to prepare is preparing to fail. And with hernia surgery, there is no question that works. We've seen some meeting at this meeting, some talks on ERAS, the early enhanced recovery after surgery. Certainly in the U.S., it's a lot of European data there. In the U.S., it's a little different. But basically speaking, we're looking at pre-op, pre-admission counseling, carboloading, et cetera. We'll talk about that, some of those things. So I think what you have to do is pick and choose which of these work for you. Which, Which of these give you some benefit in your hospital, in your setting, with your support systems, and then find those? The key is use the same thing every time. I mean, you know, Henry Ford told us a long time ago, variability is death. When we start doing the same thing every time and we're giving feedback to the individual surgeons, that's when we start seeing some change difference. So let's talk for a second about prehab. Does it make a difference for us, whether it's ventral hernia, complex ventral hernia, or anything? There is now data, especially in the orthopedic literature, was saying that prehabilitation, getting ready for surgery, which includes a physical training individualized to the patient, whether it be with a walker, or whether it be walking them stairs, or whether it be walking a couple of blocks or miles, decrease their complication rates and length to stay. But combined with prehabilitation is required. We really need to get good nutrition. We know, now know that to get an anabolic effect, to overcome the anabolic threshold, we need about 25 grams of protein per meal. Many people would argue now, one of our protein scientists would say 25 grams per meal, and then do an exercise program, or let's do some physical training, at least some muscle activity. And again, you're not going to get some little lady 65 years old out training but you can get her walking around the block or you can get her walking in her house. So those things make a difference. You can see nicely here. If you just fast a patient negative nitrogen balance, just feed them. We go into a little less negative nitrogen balance. And then you can see giving them amino acids that exercise positive. But when we give them amino acids and exercise, then we get a 20% increase in our lean body tissue uptake of that protein we gave. So there's no question it makes a difference. Pre-op glucose, we've seen two good papers this meeting with this. We know there's a 21% complication, percent complication rate versus a 37% complication without good glucose control for the same size hernia, for the same risk, for the same population. So clearly it doubles our risk. If we look at remote control, if we look at four to eight weeks or 10 weeks before surgery, we look for hemoglobin A1C, we know the curve of complications starts to rapidly rise at about 7.5. So anything over 7.5, 7.2, we know is a problem. 8.0 is where we set our cutoff at. I've recently gone down to 7.5. This is most of the time elective surgery. There's no need to rush. We postpone them, wait another month, give them, take another check. It's worth it. Believe me to do it. We've got good data to show that now in abdominal reconstruction. Now, what about in the immediate perioperative period? We can there say 140 to 180 is our so-called sweet, sweet spot, no pun intended. You know, we went for in 2001, 2003, Greed Vandenberg's data drove us to say we should get meticulous glucose control at 110. That really is not needed. In fact, uh, we know now that we're killing people with hyperglycemia when we try to get 80 to 110 as our position. 
Okay, and, and that's, that's a long story why we got that. But basically now we've got good data, big prospect of randomized multinational uh, studies with eight to 10,000 patients show a difference. What about weight loss? You know, in our hands, we get about 10% that really take this into goal and do lose weight. Generally speaking, we don't see much weight loss. Okay? But we know in bariatrics, we've got level one data, and I think we can extrapolate that to general surgery. The good news is we've leveled off in America until this year. We leveled off three years in a row, but back in, back in two weeks ago or three weeks ago in February, the CDC announced that we just went over 30% of our average BMI. So we're gaining again, unfortunately. And general surgery, we get the worst of it. Look at this. We're the highest, heaviest specialty there is. Now, what about smoking? No question. Smoking makes a big difference. There's great data here. I mean, we know in this study is probably the best study to date because it took volunteers done in Denmark. Or, you know, and you can see nicely what he did here is he had four groups, smokers, non-smokers, those who quit smoking, and those who quit smoking with a nicotine patch. Asking the question, is it nicotine or is it the cigarettes? And you can see nicely that if you're a smoker, you get a 12% chance. These are four little incisions made on the iliac crest of volunteers, college students who needed the money, I'm sure. Okay. So the question is, how bad was it? And when they got 12% of their smokers down to 2% for non-smokers, if you quit smoking for 30 days, you went down to 2.3%, and nicotine patch did not hurt you. It was not the vasoconstriction we always talk about with nicotine. It didn't seem to make a difference, and now many people argue that nicotine patches or gum won't hurt the patient. That study says have held up. And we've got continued. We know this is truly a teaching point. People will remember. There's good government programs. 1-800-QUIT-NOW is a great program. It talks about how to get people to quit. And again, it's a good time to start the people to lose. What about nutritional input? Well, we no, I spent 30 years of my life studying nutrition. We still don't have a good definition of nutrition. People ask me today, what's the definition of nutrition? I don't have one. It's not the albumin. It's not the pre-albumin. We wish. Those are surrogate markers of nutrition and not markers of nutrition. They're what's going on metabolically. So the best thing we've got to date is the lean body tissue across L3. If you look at the lean body tissue across L3, they measure lean body tissue to fat ratios. That is the best predictor of outcome for all these things. Pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, lymphoma, esophageal cancer predictors of days on trauma when you're over 65 years old, hepatomas, and now abdominal wall reconstruction. We just completed that paper. So I think that's something we can use. We're almost always getting hernia, uh, getting CT, so these big hernias. I think that cross-sectional imaging will show you this is just a paper case came out on pancreatic cancer. What about should we do? Let's say we find someone who's, who certainly has lots loss of lean body mass. What should we do? Well, back in 1984, this is the earliest paper we have, a prospective study, randomized clinical trials showing us that preoperative nutritional preparation makes a difference. Look, decreased mortality, decreased mortality, better outcome, better outcome, decreased mortality. But this is still the, probably the best study to date, 2012, prospective randomized. They screen the patients, which is key. They're using the NRS 2002, which is Nutritional Risk Index, which is used commonly in Europe, not common in the United States. Screen them, take your high-risk population, and then spend a couple of weeks of focused nutrition, high-protein diet, and those patients decrease their complications from 50% down to 25%. So it's worth your time and energy. What about, uh, as Todd or was mentioned, I think Christy mentioned, this idea of giving a pre-op immune modulating. Is there data for that? Certainly starting back in 2011, we have our first big meta-analysis, 33 cases, certainly decreased reduction in infections, decreased hospital stay. Then in the annals, we see another one, 26 to 26 showed decreased complications, infectious complications, et cetera. Another one on GI malignancies, and the most recent one, December of 2014, 74 studies, 7,000 patient meta-analysis, now showing all of these things, overall complications, infections, intradominal abscess, anastomotic leak, sepsis, and now mortality decrease. So the concept that we can give a couple of things, fish oils and arginine being the keys, and lower the patient's metabolic response to stress and get them out of the hospital faster, decrease infectious complications, are clearly here. It should be part of our routine practice. Multiple companies make these solutions, not a big issue. 
again, we've got human data, we've got animal data. We now know that not only does arginine deficiency in the perioperative period develop, the bigger the insult, the more we see an argi relative arginine deficiency. And there is data, although I'm, you know, there is data showing that makes a difference for both the arginine effects of nitric oxide and arginase, et cetera, but also now we know the macrophage change in phenotype. We go from a type 1 macrophage to a type 2 macrophage, which is a resolution macrophage. So we change the phenotypic expression of a macrophage from an inflammatory macrophage to a resolution of inflammation macrophage with arginine. EPA and DHA is our source of anti-inflammatory lipids. We thought for years that was the only source. We now know that they have a myriad of effects decreasing inflammation by things we never even thought about before. Probably the biggest effect, as you can see here, we're just lowering the inflammatory response and metabolic stress related to it. This is a great study done at Lausanne, Switzerland, met Berger and her group, 2007, in which they gave an hour of fish oil prior to the insult of endotoxin, again, the poor restricted you know, medical students who were literally probably poor and needed the money. They gave them endotoxin. And then one hour later, gave him, gave him the endotoxin after one hour infusion and showed the metabolic response to that stress. Virtually every metabolic parameter you could measure was lowered by 20 to 25 percent. Cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, et cetera, et cetera. Now, does that translate to patients? We certainly have it here in cabbages. We can lower the metabolic response to stress by loading with fish oil and also in whipples. We can do the same thing. So, so I, I think, think we lower the metabolic response. We now know much of the effect of fish oils or by these compounds called specialized pro-resolving molecules, which is a very nice article in Nature 2014, talks about these. Their work at picogram to nanogram range. They're, they're developed from the fish oils in the circulation. So if the fish oils are in your circulation, you develop these, which enhance killing of bacteria, enhance conversion to M2 macrophages, accelerate removal of inflammatory debris, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is real. This is no joke. This is real. We've got science from single cell organisms to humans that shows this works. And we can do it very easily. Pre-op carbo loading, I used to be a big advocate. I think it's icing on the cake, maybe even the cherry on top of the icing, I'm not sure. It's, you can do it, but it's sometimes a lot of run for a short slide. We do it. We, now, we used to think we had to give carbohydrate the night before and the morning of, but now we know 50 grams of carbohydrate three hours prior to surgery gives us insulin resistance benefit. Lowers insulin resistance, better glucose control in the perioperative period. What about bathing? We know that we may cause trouble by just just scrubbing and using hippoclines, but now decolonization is data is again here. We've got 2010, the Bodhi trial, the 6,771 patients, intention of treat analysis showed we could decrease post-op staph aureus by 44%. No question that benefit it was too good to be true, too easy. For five bucks, you know, Pearson 20 gram tube, Cost of 20 it costs about three bucks, 80 or eight ounces of hippoclens, 80 cents. So for four and a half bucks, you've got 44 de decrease, 44 percent decrease in staph aureus. Too good to be true that it was shown also in these are joint surgeries, 47 and 37 percent decrease. Easy to do, cheap, skin prep, not to worry. Profile antibiotics again, how much to give here? Again, dosing is key, timing is the key. Get it in 20 to 30 minutes before prep, but at least four to five minutes for circulation time. Your prophylaxis should be in. This is an old study from the New England Journal. The new JAX data of 20 years is almost identical in 2013. What should we use? ANSEF is most cases, obviously, routine, unless you're going to do something with the colon. You know, but routine ANSEF is fine. Clindid, which should you be your second. You know, we, we don't, don't like to use third-generation cephalosporins. We know that's a problem. The problem for using VANC is we've got to push the dose a little bit because of the size of our patients. So the BMI over 30 requires 2 grams. The BMI over 45 requires 3 grams to raise the MIC at the level of the tissue if they just had 10 minutes of circulation. So again, 3 grams using no increased complications. We know that VANC requires a higher dose. We know, we know that there's, there's been what called MIC drift with vancomycin. 2001, 
In 2001, 19% of patients were shown to have MICs above one microgram. In 2010, it's 70% of people. So again, talk to your pharmacist. It does require not just a routine one gram of VANC pre-op. We many times say 1.5 or 1.6 grams to calculate that based on renal function. How long should we give our antibiotics? Most people say, well, when the staple, last staple goes on, last stitch goes in, stop your antibiotics. You the list of prospective trials that would support that. Certainly, we don't give antibiotics until the drains come out. We have no data except in maybe cardiac surgery with mediastinal drains. There's a little data that says 48 hours may be better. The dosing I mentioned already, again, this is the summary of the dosing we talked about. For our organ patients here, you can see hair removal certainly is the case. We do it. Do we need to? Probably not. There's no difference in outcome. Surgical barriers, you know, the shoes don't make a difference, you know, again, but we do it. Now, what about atraumatic tissue handling? Certainly the tenants of Halstead at my residence. Uh, we go over those. They want to know who Halstead was. It's always worrisome. Okay, the closing of the midline. You know, we've learned. I've, this is one of the things after 35 years of surgery that changed my tune. I actually started doing the more the narrow bites. Okay, these narrow bites closer together came out in 2009 with the first big study about Melbourne, and there's been two studies since the stitch study most recently out showing us again narrow stitches closer together certainly decreases our post-op. That's on our first uh, time uh, <coughs> use. Now, what about prophylactic mesh? It's probably time to start considering the use of prophylactic mesh in our high-risk patients. Certainly, Anosal Surgery 2016, this is a very nice article, in the AAA patients, prospective randomized, multi-center, 120 patients with AAA, retromuscular placement of a large pore, two-year follow-up, you can see at one year, 17% versus zero at two years, 28% hernia versus 0%. I think in this high-risk AAA population with no high-risk for incisional hernia, it may be reasonable. Now, in this country, we're not doing so many open AAAs anymore. Other things we don't worry about. The last thing I want to mention is the concept that we are altering the microbiome with many things we do. You know, lots of talk about the microbiome, that we change it, probably for the bad 90% of the time when you start talking about doing big surgery with lots of antibiotics. But other things are going on. We still have ID guys who think we should be killing bacteria. Many of us now believe we should be giving back bacteria. And there's lots of reasons why we should be giving back healthy bacteria because we know a single dose of broad-spectrum antibiotics makes increase our pathogens in our colon. Single dose. Okay, we look at this, antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Remember, the most common source of antibiotic-associated diarrhea is people getting prophylactic antibiotics for surgery. This is 82 studies, 11,000 patients giving a probiotic at the same time decreases antibiotic-associated diarrhea, 0 0.001, 0 0.001 significance. What about C. diff? This is our first big trial, prospective trial on C. diff. 2007, 0 of 57 versus 9 of 53 in an intention to treat well controlled trial. Now, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, which they tell me is their best journal, the, intern, the residents, medicine residents carry it in their pockets, must be pretty good. 2012, 66% decrease in C. diff. I mean, you, there's nothing you can do that costs you a buck, a buck or two bucks at the most, that's going to decrease your complications. The Cochrane analysis for C. diff. Cochrane analysis supports it, but remember, you'll play ain't going to make it. Okay? You can't. And I got nothing against you'll play. It tastes great, but it's meant that what bacteria is in there is for fermentation and taste and rates of fermentation, not the probiotic effect we see. So you can't use this. The study shows just that. I think, pro, as I mentioned at the beginning, protocols and preparation, whether it be MRS, MRS state clearance, nutrition protocols, exercise protocols, they work. And that's why we should look at our patients. So in summary, what can we say? Certainly there's solid data, preoperative preparation, very big abdominals on smoking cessation. Probably the single best thing you can do is smoking cessation. Attention to nutrition. Okay, preoperative and perioperative glucose control. Hemoglobin A1C, 7.5 to 8, 
should be a cutoff delayed if you can. Obviously, you can't do it for emergencies. Perioperative, keep that between 120 and 160, 140, 180. 180 should be your max. Over 200, we start to see alterations in macrophage function. Antibiotic choices, get it in early and keep it there. Alcohol containing skin prep, doesn't matter whether you use iodine or hippocleanse, as long as you get alcohol in the prep, you're gonna get the same effect. Minimize your transfusions, careful with your volume. We're still, bowel prep still all over the map. Remember for years we said, well, we don't need them anymore, then some data came out of Michigan saying it's very good data showing maybe we do need them. So again, that's still there. Warming and hyperoxygenation, probably not so true anymore as long as you don't drop below 35. The statins, carbo-loading, I think we're waiting prospective studies, only looking at individual things there. But I think the key is bundles. Bundles are the key. So I think we can say a couple things. One of the greatest opportunities, this quote was in Lancet 2004, one of the greatest opportunities to improve patient outcome will probably come not from discovering new treatments and spending a thousand bucks on new drugs, but using more effective delivery of existing therapies. Thank you very much.